Hey guys, subscribe for daily knife content. And if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for links to some great online retailers. There's also individual links for knives that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got a super interesting knife review to share with you guys. Very weird knife. This is the Terrain 365 and PDW or Prometheus Design Works. Invictus. Right? It looks like a nice pocket knife. It looks like a, you know, for those of you familiar with the uh, the uh, Invictus, think, yeah, I've seen that before. So what? This one's made by Terrain 365. Uh, what's so special about it? Uh, this is using a blade material called Teravantium or Dendritic Cobalt. Notice I say material and not steel, and that's because this is not steel. Very, very weird. We're going to talk about that. Uh, keep in mind, if you're new to my channel, I am not a testing channel. I'm a knife enthusiast who likes to comment on the build quality of these items, uh, and then basically my understanding of the, uh, you know, the, the composition. Normally with steel, in this case, uh, something called Teravantium, it's based on a little bit of usage experience um, and then a lot of basically a lot of reading. It's a lot like what you guys do. I'm not a professional metallurgist. I'm not a professional when it comes to this type of material, right? I can offer you guys some basic information. Um, I have read up on it a little bit though and I'm gonna share with you guys what I know and then I'm gonna comment on the build quality of this item uh, and then what I think about the price essentially. But this is interesting and I think a lot of you will find this um, entertaining and interesting at the same time. Thank you so much to Andy who sent this in, <coughs> excuse me, for review. These are uh, hard to find right now. Um, they are they were small batch originally and they will probably continue to be that way if they continue to make them. So um, it's not, you can't go out and pick this exactly up right now. So I do thank Andy for sending this in and letting me take a look. Uh, thanks so much to my generous patrons who are supporting me right now. You can find a link for my Patreon right down in the description. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. Let's go ahead and get through uh, basic measurements and things here quickly. Overall length of this knife uh, is coming in at about 8.1 inches overall. Blade length is about 3.5 and, and cutting edge is about 3 inches thanks to a very large forward choil. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and its little brother, the Rat 2. You can see here we are at an angle a little bit and that's so that I can see while I'm talking. Um, but you can see here uh, the Rat is definitely longer. Um, get these butt to butts, even though it doesn't look like it, the rat is much longer and the, uh, the rat one and the rat two is definitely shorter. You can see that it's also not a super tall profile, kind of similar to the rat in terms of height. How about up against the Spyderco, um, PM2 and Para 3, uh, the PM2, even though once again, it's looking like it is, um, uh, not quite as long. It actually is just a little bit longer than the Invictus here and uh, the Para 3 uh, coming in a little bit shorter. Last but not least, the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, and its little brother, the Benchmade Mini Griptilian. Ritter Hogue, I believe, also comes in at exactly 8.1 inches overall. Um, it appears to be uh, maybe a hair shorter, uh, and then, the, of course, the uh, Mini Griptilian there coming in substantially shorter. Let's go ahead and do a hardware check on this guy. We'll get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the description. Uh, I'm gonna guess that the pivot is a T8. That's what it looks like anyway. So, pivot on this guy. Yeah, T8. I'm gonna try. There's a little bit of movement in there. I'm just, out of curiosity, I'm gonna try a T9. No, that is definitely a that is definitely a T8. So we have T8 uh, for uh, T8 for the pivot, and then I'm not even going to check it. The body screws are definitely T6, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I hate T6, but there aren't too many of the screws. It's a simple uh, frame lock construction. Um, so uh, yeah, it, just be careful. You know, make sure you've got a place uh, to put your screws, and make sure that you're not applying excess torque so you don't strip them, uh, and you should be just fine. On the inside, you can get my flashlight down in the description. Whoa, sorry, I had that super bright. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about it here in a sec. Uh, we have milled out titanium on one side, and then on the other side, it is solid G10. There are two versions of this knife. Um, there's a, a G10 you know, scale version, and then there's a titanium scale version. Normally, you'd think, oh, I bet the G10 one is substantially less expensive than the full titanium one. No, they're like within 30 bucks of each other. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. 
Um, but this one's going to weigh less because it is uh, G10 and titanium um, versus uh, full titanium. I have to assume the full titanium variant probably has some milling pockets just like this one does uh, on the, uh, you know, on, on, the, on both, side, both sides of the titanium and the all titanium version. Um, let's go ahead and do uh, carry profile. So thickness up against the spider co through. You can see here this is not a thick knife. Definitely not. Uh, in fact, it's a hair. It's about exactly the same thickness, honestly, as a spider co three. Height and length up against the PM2 and Para 3. You can see here because this is a sort of pill shaped knife, um, we don't have a lot of excess height. You know, there's no flipper tab. It's a thumb stud uh, operated knife. So um, longer than the PM, uh, the, the Para 3, and a little bit shorter than the PM2. So there you go. It definitely is a full size knife though. And the blade stock is not necessarily mega thin. I'm going to try and get it to stand up there. It's a little bit rounded, so it's not wanting to stay perfectly that way. Uh, let me get my calipers out. Uh, the uh, blade stock thickness on this guy, I'm going to guess it's 145. Yeah, 145 thousandths or so. So very similar to the Spyderco PM2. Weight, I'm going to guess this is probably four and a half ounces. That's what it feels like. 4.13 ounces. Okay. So, there's a lot of different ratios you can apply there, right? Whatever your feelings are on weight, uh, apply them as you see fit. For me, this is easy. This is going to be easy to carry. I wear jeans normally, so this is going to be just fine. If you live in an area where this blade length is illegal, or you've been used to carrying knives that are much lighter or smaller, then this might not be for you. But for most people, this is going to be kind of like, yeah, this is about, you know, if you carry a norm, like a full-size knife, if you think like me, an 8-inch knife is kind of your run-of-the-mill full-size knife, right? Four ounces, right around that point. It's kind of, there's a lot of stuff out there that's really popular that's right around that size. So a lot of people are used to carrying stuff like that. I think that's going to be just fine. How's the action on the sky? Uh, the action is actually very impressive. Uh, this runs on bearings and it is quite smooth. In fact, it's approaching, you know, this has been used, it's been carried a little bit, uh, but uh, this is essentially fall shut. And it's very smooth and it feels really good. Um, access to the thumb stud is um, substantial considering we have a nice large scallop there. I'm going to turn the exposure up just a little bit to capture all of this in as much detail as possible. Um, yeah, the thumb stud is nicely rounded. It's not aggressive or sharp. Um, and there's uh, ample room in there because of the um, scallop. So it's actually really easy to deploy. You can also get the meat of your finger underneath there and do the reverse flick with this guy. Um, even though there's not as much room on this side. It's, it's great. The thumb studs do stick out a bit past the frame, which is kind of awkward. Um, and, you know, it's just a little bit, though. If you look right here, you can see the, the tips of the, the bulbs just barely peeking past. Are they? <sighs> see, what's weird is when I look at it, yeah, it's hard, you, it's hard to see it. Just barely, you can see them sticking past the peaks of this, of the contoured scales. It's not much, though. Um, and if it is in excess so that you can engage them, then, um, you know, then I'm, I'm happy with that because I can engage them easily and it, it feels comfortable. I don't know that that's going to cause any issue. The slight amount that they might peek past the frame, if that's actually going to cause any sort of issue with carry, I doubt it, right? But I'm a nitpicky reviewer, so I'm going to point that out. Um, so there you go. The action is great. The detent is nice and clicky. Uh, right there, click into place. Feels good, no detent lash, right? It's fine. Um, we've got, uh, in this case, G10. Um, this is, you know, the lines that I, we see on the G10 here, it's, it's, um, those are, it's characteristic of the, uh, uh, the, the Invictus. You know, we see that on the Invictus, you know, that from, from the past of the different versions of the Invictus. Um, this has a very straightforward, uh, very, in my opinion, very classy uh, profile. I think, you know, Terrain 365, you take a look at their website and their thing is like outdoorsy meets tactical. And I think um, Prometheus Design Works shares a lot of that. Whatever, you, however you feel about the aesthetic and what it, what you think it means. I mean, this, this is a cutting tool. So that's what I see as a cutting tool that, you know, has more classiness associated with it than tacticalness, whatever that is, the essence of it, right? It looks good. I like it. I like straight lines. Um... You know, a lot of people, I, you know, when I talked about my uh, uh, Invictus that I had through ProTech, you know, kind of shared the same thought. 
And then there were other people saying, I think it looks hideous, right? So it's just another, it's case in point that <clears throat> ask a million people, you're going to get a, you know, that many different answers. You're just going to get a lot of different opinions out there. I like how this looks. I think it looks clean. I look, think it looks classy. Personally, I would probably enjoy the full titanium version of this better. I think I just would. There's a lot of little things here that I appreciate, like how the um, uh, the, the spine of the blade is crowned, um, and basically how it meets up with this backspacer, which is interesting because it, it meets all, it, it, it extends basically the full length of the uh, the scales here and meets up with the um, tang of the blade. Uh, the backspacer is actually the stop, which is pretty cool, and there's some rounding right there, so that's nice. As far as the stop on the inside, I believe, you know, gosh, guys, I got to be honest with you. Is the stop in the, for the closed position also? Mm, yeah, it is. The stop is also the backspacer for the, uh, in the closed position. All right. That's cool. Not a traditional stop pin, but I, I that, that's neat. Um, is uh, a full backspacer going to give you an advantage over pillar construction or a partial backspacer? I don't, I don't know. It makes, it might make it a little bit more difficult to clean out because you have to put a cloth in this side and go and you, whatever, right? It is what it is. It might be adding a little bit of extra weight to it, but it does look nice. I don't know. This whole thing looks very, very modern. This looks like it was definitely made like this. Well, this year's 2021. I think this, this model came out in 2020, but yeah, it looks like a, a, a knife that is extremely modern, and uh, I, I like that. Uh, I like the jimping right here. I also like these little touches like this, I don't know, this short little rise right there and how they have that rounded out. It looks nice. It also is very, very polished, very finished. Uh, it looks like it was gone over and then gone over again and again and again to achieve this very, I don't know, there are no sharp edges on this knife, and I mean like where even where it's acceptable to find a sharp edge, like the inner lip of something that you would never run across with your fingers. Even those areas are knocked down. Everything is so beautifully knocked down. It's just really, I don't know, it's for somebody like me who does get under a magnifying glass sometimes, literally, and look at this stuff, it's very satisfying. I mean, you can see even like the, the thumb studs are... They're, they're polished and they're nicely rounded down and knocked down and the edges of them, everything just feels nice and crisp and oh, it's very, it's very satisfying. Absolutely. Um, I think it's important to point out, this is not a knife that you want to push up. You really do need to come just a little bit this way um, to uh, get it to deploy. But once you figure that out, once you adapt to it, you, it's fine. Nice polished uh, show side pivot there. I think, uh, you know, the lack of any complexity. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm going to get crazy poetic with the dialogue here. I like that it's simple because the, the rest of the knife is simple, right? The lines on the knife are simple. And then there there's polished work in the, the details when you look up close. I like stuff like that, right? I like little areas like this where the, uh, the relief cut uh, for access to the lock bar uh, is has got some extra uh, milling in there, and it is at the same time also knocked down, so it's not aggressive or sharp. That's something that I appreciate. Insides of the G10 right here, these are nicely knocked down. Same inside lips of the titanium. That's what I'm talking about. Little things like that. Really nice. The blade. It says Terrain 365 has their logo, and then it's really, really tiny. I kind of I, I like that. It's They're not putting a whole lot. And then on this side, it says Terravantium USA. Yes, this knife is made in the USA. All right. I've put this off long enough, 13 minutes into this. Let's talk about Teravantium. Again, I'm not going to be able to give you guys a full comprehensive understanding of this material. It's not necessarily a new material. It's been around for a bit. You Google it, you're going to find out about boy uh, dendritic cobalt, which is what this is. Well, it's dendritic cobalt, but you're going to you're going to read about Boy, Dendritic Cobalt, or BDC. Uh, so you can read up on that if you want to. Um, this is Terrain 365's proprietary cake mix. Or, well, cake. Is it a different cake mix? I don't know. Here's what I'm going to do.
just so that we have consistent, uh, consistently accurate information, what I'm going to do is read off of Terrain 365's website, which I know is something that you can do yourself. But just to make sure that at least people who are coming to the Metal Complex YouTube channel, right? Even if I just if I'm just reading off the website, I still want to make sure that I'm getting this right, right? And there's no better way to get it perfectly accurate than just to read off the website. So, dendritic cobalt. What may? <coughs> excuse me, I'm still fighting off a cough. What makes a dendritic cobalt blade exceptional? Dendritic cobalt is a non-magnetic cobalt alloy. It will never rust, corrode, pit, or stain, and holds a sharp edge for a very long time. These properties allow for a great edge tool for just about every and any outdoor adventure. Interesting how they worded that. Whether scuba diving, fishing, hunting, camping, backpacking, climbing, river running, portaging, or whatever adventure comes your way. I gotta be honest with you guys. I don't know what portaging means, but there you go. Uh, what is dendritic cobalt? Dendritic cobalt is a non-ferrous, non-magnetic -mag alloy. It is a dense network of interconnected carbide crystals in a cobalt matrix. There, that's all dialogue that I am not going to... Th this is dialogue that is foreign to me. And I, again, I have to emphasize and stress that I am not a professional, right? That's not. This is not my area of expertise. The carbide crystal structure is surrounded by the softer cobalt matrix, which holds the carbide in place and creates a micro serrated edge, essentially a microscopic, highly aggressive saw blade. We're going to talk more about that here in a sec. When used as a blade, it sets up an edge that is exceptionally wear resistant and extremely sharp. Every time the blade is sharpened, a new uh, micro serrated edge is exposed, producing another extremely sharp edge. That's also very interesting. Um, that uh, was what initially intrigued me when I was reading about this. Teravantium is our provi uh, proprietary name of our dendritic cobalt products. Several types of dendritic cobalt exist on the market under various name, uh, trade names, which is again what I was talking about previously, but overall remains rare in the modern cutlery industry. It is a costly material and requires a different set of processes to produce and finish. One of the distinct properties of Teravantium is that we do not roll out our investment cast bar stock or blades, which separates the carbide crystals. The microscopic carbide crystals retain their original structure, resulting in longer lasting and superior cutting performance. So there you go. If you're wondering what's the difference between teravantium and regular old dendritic cobalt, <laughs> that apparently is the difference. So there's that information. You can go to their website and read about that or read essentially what I read again if you want to. Uh, the, main <coughs> the main thing here is um, it can't rust. That's pretty cool. That seems to be all the, you know, that that's all the rage right now with these modern, um, you know, blade materials. Name most of most of what we've seen in that department has been steel, like uh, Vanax Super Clean and LC two hundred N, which essentially cannot corrode, right? But they still have good cutting performance. What people want to know, I'm sure, is I, I'm sure you guys are thinking, okay, Complex, just tell us how is is it. Does it have good edge retention? What does it compare to, right? Uh, tell us about that. I am going to tiptoe around this because I can't tell you guys exactly. My experience with this is that even though it really kind of feels dull, to be honest with you guys, it kind of feels dull, it does <laughs> shred cardboard like it's nothing. It's very odd. I talked with Nick Shabazz about this, and he was the first one to bring that to my attention. I thought when I touched this blade, because as you can see here, this, this knife has been used. I thought, okay, it's got a nice clean edge, right? This thing hasn't been beat on. It doesn't have chips or anything in it. But it just feels like an edge that has been worn down by some use. Apparently not. Apparently, right after you sharpen this stuff, right, right after you use it, it will lose that sort of sticky, bitey edge. Now, when, when I heard micro saw teeth, I instinctively, you know, felt it out, like trying to feel it. I'm not going to tell you guys I can actually feel the micro saw, te saw teeth. I'm not. It, it just feels like a glassy edge that's been used on some light or medium density material like cardboard. Uh, or not medium density, medium, you know, abrasiveness, I guess. Like cardboard. And the edge is just worn down. Um, no, apparently this is just how this stuff feels. And it will continue to eat through cardboard as if it is still that sticky by the edge that's right off the stone. Um, and uh, and once it finally does wear down, when you sharpen it, it exposes, like in what it said here in the readout, a new, you know, set of saw teeth. 
Um, and these micro saw teeth are, you know, that's what that's what allows this to continue to cut through that material, even though it really doesn't feel all that sharp. So that's weird. That's really different, right? This is a uh, this. It's not steel. There's no iron present. The other interesting thing is that apparently now I'm not going to say specifically that this is the, the truth for teravantium, but what from right what I read about dendritic cobalt is that the Rockwell hardness only gets to about 40, right? Now, when we're talking about steel, 40 is way too soft. 40 is butter soft. You do not want steel at that hardness. It's not going to perform well. But again, this isn't steel. The rules are all different here. So how does that translate? I mean, in terms of edge retention, what are we looking at here? Like, I mean, I, I know people are going to, how does it stack up against a steel like M390? From what I understand, this stuff has incredible edge retention. Does that mean that it's better than M390, worse than M390? Well, there's a lot of factors, right? We're talking about the M390 composition, right? And what it's supposed to be hardened to, which is about 61, 62, right? Um, again, you know, the hardness with this stuff and how it applies to, or how it ultimately translates to edge, edge retention is substantially different, right? From what I understand, this seems to have edge retention that is superior to your common knife steels and more along the lines of, you know, some of the, the upper ends, right? The, the really, the really, uh, really uh, high end edge retention steels, right? Um, so it's going to compete with those. How exactly? I don't know. I can't give you guys that information, but it's up there. That's the, the reports that I've read is that it's very, very impressive in that department. It also can't corrode. Now that's great right there. High edge retention and it can't corrode. Those two elements right there are generally going to be enough to attract people, um, you know, to this material for day to day use. That's great. Um, how, how about sharpening? The, the nice thing is, is that, you know, people are reporting that you can uh, take an Arkansas stone to this thing and touch it up or sharpen it up pretty easily. It doesn't, you know, people are reporting from my understanding or what I've read that it's not like trying to resharpen S110V or Maximate or something like that. Some ultra hard steel that's very aggressive and can be chipped, right? It's not like that. It also, from what I understand, does not have the chippiness, you know, that people get, you know, that, that uh, is frustrating to experience with some of those steels. So is it tough? That's the most confusing part about this stuff. Is it tough? I think I kind of get everything else, but is it tough? I don't know. I think probably reasonably tough, at least. Uh, what does that mean? The resistance to the, the, the edge fracturing or chipping under heavy pressure or impact uh, like if you're, you know, if you were chopping with it, right? If you go out, you got a PM2 that's an S110V and you start chopping away at a, a can of peaches, right? You're going to dick up that edge and you're going to have a, a, a hell of a time trying to put an edge back on it. You do the same thing with this guy, right? I mean, why would you do that? Under normal, you know, with normal use, right? If you accidentally, let's say you slip off what you're cutting and you run the edge into a rock. I don't know. I think this stuff is moderately tough. At least it could be substantially tougher than, you know, than, uh, than that. But this isn't my knife and I'm not going to go take it out and do a destruction test on it. Um, because that's not what I do with the stuff that's sent in here. Right. Um, but, uh, just cutting cardboard and stuff. It, the, the craziest thing that I picked up is that it cuts like it was fresh off the stone. And it just keeps going, but it doesn't feel all that sharp. It's so weird. Like I can almost, I'm not going to do it. I almost feel like I can drag my thumb down the blade and expect not to get cut. But then when I push it through cardboard, it's, it's a machine. Very interesting. The downside to it. So what's the downside? I mean, people are like, well, it sounds like, you know, dream material. The downside is, is that it's going to be freaking expensive super expensive and we're not we don't see a lot of it outside of you know right now <coughs> uh terrain 365 has it on a bunch of their knives and but at the same time they're also some of their models the same models are coming out in m390 so there you go 
long, long, um, you know, explanation and basically my experience with this. But I think as time progresses and uh, as some of the other channels that are more geared towards testing and, you know, retesting and putting a different edge at a different angle and comparing with this, right? There's a lot of other channels out there that do it. Well, I'd say better than me that do it, right? I don't even do it, but there's a lot of other channels that do stuff like that. And it helps with the reporting for not only for channels like mine, but ultimately for, you know, like people, you know, who want to pick this stuff up, viewers like you guys, you know, it's advantageous for everybody. So in the future, maybe we'll have more detailed information, hopefully, because <laughs> what I just gave you guys is the tip of the iceberg. That's all I'm capable of giving you. That's all I'm, I've ever been capable of giving on this channel. So there you go. Uh, as far as the blade goes, that we have this sort of bead blasted finish, which is fine. Normally I'm like, well, bead blasting and that nah, because bead blasted uh, finishes, you know, they, they create little micro pits in the surface of the, uh, the blade and that can trap moisture and then that can cause corrosion. That doesn't matter on this guy because it can't rust. So who cares, right? The blade finish is fine, actually. It, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that now that I'm realizing that it can't rust, I'm kind of like, oh, I kind of like bead blasting. It kind of looks nice, right? It does look good. Uh, we have this sort of exotic bird blade shape here. Not so, not so much like the dead bird look of a uh, spider co PM2, right? The dying pelican blade. Um, no, but it, it's kind of has a sort of a bird's beak, right? Not the curvature, but just down here. It just kind of has that beaky sort of snout look. It's, it's nice, right? We have this flat that carries out about 85%, carrying much of the thickness out to the tip. So that's fine. In terms of geometry, uh, this is definitely going to be a more durable geometry than your, you know, your average blade. If the average blade looks just like the Ontario Rat Model 1, I would say that's about average. Yeah, this is definitely going to be a little bit more robust. Um, the Sorry, I'm trying to get it to focus here. We have that uh, that uh, fuller that is uh, distinctive. It, it's, it's something that you see on the Invictus. I think it looks really nice. We have a swedge up here. Um, truthfully, the shape of the blade, you can see it's kind of... You can see where the center point is um, and uh, just the overall profile is straight. And then there's a drop <clears throat> towards the end out towards the tip. Um, and it's, I think it's actually pretty curvature starts here on the spine and it starts about here on the cutting edge. So it's not perfectly symmetrical, but it does, you know, the end result is appealing to the eye, uh, at least from my perspective. So I like that. Do the thumb studs glow? Talk about that. Yeah, they do. I think it's some kind of, it, it's some sort of oddball material that's not just regular, whatever regular glow material is, but it's also not tritium, which is always glowing, right? Um, so I'll uh, charge this up for you guys here real quick and then give you a look in the dark. Um, but yeah, and we'll leave that off for a second so you can kind of see, uh, you know, how that lasts and how it's, it, it, it seems to fade much less quickly than regular, like the glow material that's in the gasket in my uh, flashlight. Uh, this gets dull much faster than this. So if you were to be in a, a, an area where there is light and it gets charged and then suddenly drop it in an area that doesn't have light, I think it's going to be, I mean, it's hard to tell right now, but this this guy, uh, the, the the material on the thumb studs uh, seems to last longer than whatever the glow material is in the gasket or just regular glow material. So that's kind of neat, right? Kind of gimmicky though too. Uh, in the the you know in the grand scheme of things, it's really not all that important. It's just kind of neat that it's that it's there, that it's like that, right? Um, blade looks good all the way around. Uh, there's uh, the the consistency in terms of the the final cutting edge. You can see it's very thin, but it is exactly the same on both sides and it looks good. Uh, the blade is obviously professionally done and the edges are nicely knocked down. So there's nothing sharp outside of the cutting edge. Um, it is pretty thick behind the edge. I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys that this is a laser beam in terms of how it cuts. This is so weird. This is a perfect example of how the material of the blade in combination with the geometry can play a role in how it cuts. And then beyond that, uh, you know, <coughs> exactly how the composition re responds to this, the, the a certain types of material, right? So this material is exceptional, apparently, at cutting these micro saw teeth are really good at cutting things like cardboard or rope, stuff that is 
sort of medium abrasive, I guess. It just saws through that stuff. Um, yeah, it does seem to make short work of that despite having a thicker than average geometry behind the edge, which is very confusing. Again, because not only because it's kind of thick behind the edge, but because it really doesn't feel all that sharp. It's weird. It's very weird. I would imagine something in a thinner geometry that was fully flat ground would just be absolute beast mode when it came to breaking down cardboard boxes, right? But because of the non-stainless nature of this stuff, the idea is, is that it's funny because it's like, well, if you're camping or hunting or fishing, right? If you're fishing, well, you're not going to be out there on a lake or in the ocean breaking down cardboard boxes. So I think the name of the game here is versatility. I think uh, the fact that it is stainless frees you up to use it in um, environments like that. And then the micro saw teeth make it, you know, really good for cutting up material like cardboard or other similar materials, right? So there's a lot of versatility in here. Um, once again, you know, this, this is another, you know, uh, uh, situation where it's really cool. It's interesting. It kind of feels like the, you know, stuff like this makes it feel like the knife world is still moving forward. Are we moving forward? Is this a territory that is necessary for the vast majority of knife buyers? No, not at all. It's just that we're not, you know, I always talk about how like um, the knife world is, from my perspective, made up of, of uh, you know, two groups, the 80 percenters and the 20 percenters. I'm an 80 percenter. I'm a common man. I use a knife for simple things and I <coughs> don't need anywhere close to the complexity or the potential, you know, the capability of something like this, right? I don't, that's not my life is needing something like this. Uh, does that mean that there are not people out there who might make good use of this? No, uh, no, I'm sure there are. In fact, those are, that's what I refer to as the 20 percenters, right? The 20% of the population who really does go out and use their knives in extreme scenarios or they need that excess versatility because of all the different situations they find themselves in because of their occupation, right? If we're talking about soldiers or, you know, people who work in, you know, data collection or field work that, you know, they, they do field work that's that they're trying to get um, data in different environments, right? Um, and they might need a knife that's uh, going to be resilient to a lot of different circumstances. So, yeah. Um, but for the vast majority of us, do we need this? No. Is it interesting from the perspective of an enthusiast? Absolutely. My entire co knife collection is basically overkill. I don't need this many knives. I certainly don't need knives that are made out of exotic materials, but I have them because they're interesting and they're fun, right? That's why we're all here. So there you go. Let's talk about fit and finish all the way around. I think we kind of, kind of touched on that. Yeah. Uh, this is obviously an extremely well-made item and it is definitely apparent uh, this is, uh, feels a step up for those wondering, I can get titanium and a, you know, really, <laughs> a really nice material, uh, through, you know, we for $200, right? Fit and finish on this guy definitely feels a step up. This feels more like what I expect from Riot. If we're going to talk about a Chinese company, uh, or more like what I'd expect from, uh, it's not, not quite hinderer reeve but close to it right this feels like a 350 dollar knife that's i guess that's as, as well as i can put it very clicky very crisp right uh the pocket clip is very long um but i'm not going to sit here and tell you guys it creates a hot spot because it doesn't it's nicely rounded off right here there is a, a nice ramp right here so continuous rise on the clip that makes it easy to slip up above most pocket seam thicknesses so that's fine scales are contoured and the knife feels really good in hand in fact ergonomically it is very comfortable uh thanks to the um that large forward choil right there um i i really like the hand positions on this knife and i really like the uh, jimping right here the traction points are good um this these little lines right here do provide some meaningful traction um, so yeah, I think the G10 one is probably going to be a little bit easier to hang on to in some of those wet environments, which again is the implication with this material. That's, those are the environments it's meant to be used in. G10 is probably going to be a little bit more grippy than the titanium, but, uh, you know, whatever it is, it is what it is. I think the titanium one will work just fine. 
Uh, I think the titanium one exists to appeal to enthusiasts like me who just are like, I want it in titanium because I like how titanium looks and feels and makes me feel good about spending this amount of money on this type of object, right? So there you go. There's a lanyard bar back here uh, that is completely and totally out of the way, so that's fine. If you are going to be working with this knife in the ocean, I think that's an area where you really would want a lanyard on your knife, so there you go. I like how the pocket clip is attached. It's uh, countersunk into the titanium frame, and then it looks like <coughs> the screw actually comes from underneath. They didn't need to do that, but they did. You'll have to, if you want to remove the pocket clip, you have to remove this scale so you can get at it. That's fine. I kind of like this little touch right here where the uh, backspacer comes around and sort of has this sort of U shape um, that really emphasizes when a blade is on center and also will definitely emphasize when it is not on center. Um, but it is on center, um, and uh, it looks really, really good. It kind of highlights the precision work that went into this, so that's nice. Eventually, it will come off center because not blades do that, right? You just need to readjust it, but this looks really, really good. I like that a lot. There is no steel lock bar inserts, which is not a big deal. You don't need it. I'm sure the titanium lock face is carbonized uh, or hardened, so it's fine. No blade play up, down, left, or right. That's exactly what I expect. And there's also no lock stick, which is great. This is a really interesting item. <clears throat> what does it come in at? The titanium version of this knife comes in at about 400 bucks, and the G10 version of this knife comes in at about $370, $380, which is weird. Uh, you're definitely... this. Here's the thing. Let's say that this was M390, and we were looking at G10 and titanium. M390 G10 Titanium, uh, if you were telling me, you know, what do you think this knife comes in at? I would say it probably is about 300 bucks. Uh, and then somebody were asked, uh, okay, now the same thing, but full titanium. I'd say probably 350 to $400. So this G10 one, I don't, it's weird because obviously a lot of what you're paying for is the, the blade material, right? So does the price make sense? On this G10 vert, yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes me question exactly how much extra I'm paying, you know, or how much, you know, like if this were M390, it's like, so they must be really overcharging me for an M390 and G10 version of this hypothetically, right, or other knives that are similar. Um, I don't know. <coughs> it doesn't feel like a $380 knife, it feels like a $300 knife. Um, but because of the material, and I'm going to guess it's kind of costly to produce, right? Is this knife recommendable? Yeah, uh, I think definitely. <laughs> um, it's made incredibly well. Uh, this, it, 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 there are elements here for collectors and enthusiasts, absolutely. But you can actually take this thing out and really use it. It's going to be exceptionally versatile and exceptionally resilient given the nature of the material, right? That's not based on extensive experience it's based on my understanding based on you know uh reading and understanding from you know other people's use but i'm sure there's a lot more um to be learned from this stuff at if it becomes more plentiful if more people get it in their hands and there's extensive testing done um but yeah it is pretty cool um it's something one of those things you'll need to experience for yourself it is a very bizarre it's just bizarre how dull it feels uh, versus how it actually performs when you're cutting cardboard. So the micro teeth thing apparently are actually there. There are actually micro teeth there and they are doing something when you're cutting. So it's, it's interesting. All right. This is a 40 minute review. Holy cow. Sorry. That's if you're new to my channel, that's what I do, especially when we've got something weird like this It's very intriguing. This is going to be going on my um, most recommended knives playlist. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, it's, you can't pick this up right now, but pay attention to terrain 365. They're working with this material and they've also got some other interesting models. So if you're looking to pick something like this up, um, I would check out the terrain 365 website. Uh, periodically, you know, there were links to this, uh, like on blade HQ. So I'll, I'll link those so you guys can go look and get more information there if you want to. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically what there is, what's out there right now. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at Metal underscore Complex. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.